Hello, I'm Jean Weger. Welcome to the world of the Spirit Hoops. In my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to go many places, do many things, but few, if any, of these experiences have equaled the power or the mystery that I have found in the sacred circle created by these special hoops. The circle has, really from the beginning of time, been an important tool in humankind's quest for meaning and understanding. No one knows exactly why. Maybe it's because it reminds us of Mother Grandmother Earth. Maybe it's because it has no beginning or end. Most likely, the reason is hidden somewhere deep in the human spirit and not accessible to the conscious mind. This interactive video is a gateway allowing those who choose to join in this quest. Those accepting the challenge of this journey will be able to use their heart, mind, and imagination. Now to do so, it will be helpful to know some of the history of the hoops. So here then is their story. A burst of spectacular splendor. Sunset, then darkness. Night and earth merge into one. To many it seems that civilization as we know it has also come to the edge of night. Just like an awe-inspiring sunset, we are surrounded by the wonders of the material world. Still, it is impossible to deny the encroachment of darkness. Hope and beauty disappear into the black hole of sleepless night. Truly, it seems that a new dark age has descended upon us, a dark age from which many fear we may never emerge. Then, in the still of the night, the moon comes out from her hiding place. Symbol of the feminine, the moon shines with a mystic glow. With magic flute she calls forth sweet love songs, opening the darkness with her delicate rays. The loon, symbol of ancient life force still present in the world, swims forth. Together for one precious moment on their bed of golden water they celebrate their love making. And in this act a new paradigm is conceived. With it comes hope for another day. As the first rays of morning light gently kiss the lake, she rises from her slumber, letting dreams float to the heavens on a magic carpet of silver-white mist. Waking, she trembles, remembering her history. The lake knows the meaning of motherhood. The lake has provided protection for her children, her children known in the world as part of the Ojibwe nation. From her body came fish and wild rice for food. In her bosom were the hallowed spaces needed for sacred ceremonies. Then came other people. These people plundered Mother Grandmother Earth, stealing her riches and raping her daughter, the lake. And then, as it had been for legions of women before her, the lake was forced into bondage by the very ones who had defiled her. Finally, her usefulness over, her beauty destroyed, she was discarded. There she lay, alone, unloved, and unwanted. Then, slowly, even as she began to heal, another group of people appeared. These were people seeking refuge from the world they themselves had created. They came searching for the peace and wholeness they believed could be found in woods and water. There's a saying in Minnesota that you can always tell a Minnesotan by the fact that they have the cabin at the lake, and we're no different. We've had the cabin at the lake for, oh, better than 30 years now. And my own belief is that for the first 20-some years, the lake tested us. And when it was satisfied that uh, we would be stewards of it and caretakers, 
it began one summer to give us hoops, and we didn't know what they were. But each time we would go out to cut the weeds and, and care for the shoreline, my husband would bring in one or more of these large hoops. Uh, they were about 36 inches in diameter. They were round. They obviously had laid on the bottom of the lake for a long, long time. For centuries, Ojibwe women had formed these circles of narrow cedar strips to carry birch bark to make their homes and dry wild rice for their food. The wonder of the gift was that the lake had given hoops created by feminine energy in exactly the same number as the points of the compass. I had come to a way of meditating that had included using the various points of the compass, various seasons of the year, the times of day. And so the hoops still kept coming until there were eight of them. Now, just as their coming to us had been a mystery, so was the way in which they made known the tasks that they were to perform. I really believe that it was they that dictated the fact that they were to become frames for paintings dealing with the stages and the aspects of life. It is they and their energy that then has given the insight needed for birthing a new paradigm. Now we enter into the circle created by these special hoops and one by one probe their mystery, learn what it is they have to teach us. Beginnings led to endings, endings led to beginnings. Birth holds the promise of death, death embraces the hope of birth. Life and hoops circles all. Each hoop symbolizes a time of day, a season of the year, and a part of life. Each is complete in itself, yet each also a part of another larger circle, a greater whole. A journey through the hoops is a journey through a double spiral. Individually, each pilgrim spirals down deeper into personal inner knowing. Collectively, they spiral upward towards social change. The hoops are intricate interlocking circles of one life and the collective wisdom of many lifetimes. They open the door to a new paradigm, a paradigm of healthy interdependent community based on the integrity and wholeness of all its parts. It was the hoops that led to the awareness of the stages and phases of life as a way of exploring human existence. The stages of life begin with conception, lead through pregnancy and birth, to infancy and early childhood, then culminate in latency and adolescence. One must go through each stage in order to get to the next one. Not so with the phases of life, leaping forth costumed in the vibrant quilt of sexuality, the bright gown of power, the majestic robe of spirituality, and the somber cloak of death. They dance their way onto every stage of life. The phases and stages interweave, shaping the circle of life, ever turning one with another. There is a tiny crack in time when it is neither night nor dawn, winter nor spring. Male and female conjoin, creating the space into which spirit may choose to enter. The call is sent forth, the tree of life is rooted. Into this special tree flies the dove of life, and there gently lays the cosmic egg of creation. Spirit form and human form commingle. The unimaginable merges with reality. 
the moment of conception occurs. Spirit becomes spirit body. Fully new and fully ancient, the commonplace and the miraculous unite. The moon is full, time is full, the contract is finalized. The word goes out, alchemy triumphs. That which was not, now is. Then the hoop of the northeast turns. Now it seems that spring and dawn will never come. All time stands still as life is lived in two worlds, knows two realities. The unborn promise of life, the beloved, and the mother are together yet separate. Each holds the power of the survival of the other in their being. This is a time of expectation and despair, joy and pain, calm and fear. Never before and never again such closeness and such distance. The fully known, just as fully unknown. That which is experienced by either mother or child is known also by the other. Still neither fully can comprehend the existence of the other. The long wait is over. The land rumbles and breaks open. Fire and lava spew forth from the belly of the earth. Blood and water are everywhere. Like her children, Mother Earth, too, knows the experience of birth. With screams of pain, mingled with tears of grief and fear, with shouts of joy blended with groans of anguish, with singing and silence, the night gives way. It is dawn at last. The vulture has since the time of ancient Egypt symbolized that aspect of feminine energy that protects by destroying that which causes illness. Its fiery eye now witnesses the opening of the gates to the garden of creation with the pouring forth of life's water. Sometimes the gates open slowly on rusty hinges of a pain that seems inconceivable, sometimes in an earthquake of power and speed. Then suddenly, a crown appears. The mother's hands reach down, catch, hold, welcome, and comfort. Against the goddess's radiant gold, the cord that connects mother, child, and goddess is cut, and life starts anew. All that is familiar changes. There's no going back. There is only the now and the future. This is the life-grasping adventure. Old is time, new is each birth. This is the journey to life, to incarnation. Once again, soul, spirit, and body collaborate to celebrate life. The song of the womb is a chant, singing of this unique yet common experience of women, children, and birth. By this song, the infant is called forth. The child enters a new world, now its home, carrying with it an age-old heritage, the wisdom of the ages mingled with the DNA of a clan. What is fresh and what is ancient interlock in a creative energy never before and never again to be known on this earth. It has occurred. The miraculous and the ordinary are growing together. The magic of a new life is a reality. Spring reaches toward summer's blossoms. The mid-morning sun kisses the earth. The time of infancy is at hand. Both mother and child are blessed. For the mother, it is the time to wear the crown of turtle and serpent. 
For the baby, it is the time to be held and nourished, cradled in the love of father, mother, family, and community. This is the time for each child to be the center of the universe. Into this wondrous present is bestowed upon the babe the blessing of both priestess and grandmother. Gifts arrive, carried from the waters of creation on the back of Earth Mother Turtle. Then does Sophia, goddess, matriarch, and holder of wisdom, descend to rest in the place between the breasts of the mother. From this space, hallowed by her presence, she feeds both mother and child with her sacred milk. In the southeast, there is a kingdom in which sand castles and smoke dreams are real. Where sterling silver has the same value as plastic beads and wooden blocks. Here, magic is an everyday occurrence. Here, one can blow bubbles the size of hot air balloons. Here, the blink of an eye brings characters from storybooks and fairy tales to life. This is the land of early childhood. To live here means the chance to run and play, sing and dance, learn and love, and most especially, the chance to see the world in a unique way. In this rich and wondrous place, there is the opportunity for family ties to grow and learning to blossom. Not all can enter here. Only the very young in body, heart, mind, and spirit can open the door to this world and walk into a place where real and make-believe blend into one rich and beautiful whole. Those permitted in usually stay but a short while. Still, some lucky ones are allowed to come back from time to time to visit and so to be renewed. In the midday meadow of the south, youth and beauty play. Still wearing the robes of innocence, they dance into a circle made up of others of their own generation. The dance leads them away from both family and childhood. They dance, becoming aware of the beat of a mysterious new drum from deep within the soul. They dance. The beat of the red waters of life begins to stir. Now the river pours forth its rich monthly flood of abundance. Now is the time of flowering, the time of awakening. Now is the time to believe one will live forever. For this is latency. There is a time when the world hangs like a yo-yo at the end of a string, when all swings back and forth, up and down, ever moving, never certain, never at rest. This is a time called adolescence. Still bright, the sunlight of hope. Still warm, the breeze of expectation. Now the creative crystal butterfly of life shatters the cocoon, spreads its wings, dries them, then flies free. In that moment, in the fluttering of white, red, and black gossamer sails, there is revealed for all to see the newly joined power of maiden, mother, and crone. This is a turbulent, expectant time of change, the birth of new ways of being. A new map emerges it foretells of rocky paths that challenge the maturing body. These paths may lead through lands swept with the destructive winds of self-doubt and the cold rains of self-hate, the tearing power of youth's tornadoes. Light and dark, up and down, calm and storm, all and nothing, hope and despair, adolescence, 
the hinge pin between child and adult, a time of being both and neither. The moon completes her journey. The mask that hides the power of the feminine drops away. Now is the time to take back the night. The deer of feminine energy runs and jumps in safety. Azurite and Malachite join, bringing healing. The royal dragon breathes a fire of protection. Black for crone, white for maiden, the right to sexual expression with safety belongs to all of life. The power of the body reigns, potent in its rightful place of honor and respect. Contained in every cell of the body is the patchwork of sexual identity. It holds the key to existence and creativity from the instant of conception until the moment of death. As the fabrics are varied, a multi-hued array, so is the expression of sexuality. For some, it is expressed in ways that are traditional. For others, its expression knows no boundaries. But whether fancy or plain, explosive or very quiet, there is no right or wrong as long as it is freely chosen. Each person, young or old, has the inherent right to protection from any form of sexual abuse. And unless the joy of sexuality has been stolen, it is magic. Sometimes this magic seems to be held in little boxes. Little boxes of the imagination holding one aspect or another of sexuality. In one box there is deer hide for the power and joy of the body. In another, jacks for playfulness. In still another one are candies for sweetness. There is a gem revealing the preciousness, pins to establish protection and boundaries, and the last box holds male and female icons honoring the spiritual aspect of sex. Sunset and autumn, the west calls. The winds of change blow across the sea of history. This sea, filled with the blood and tears of women, protected by the ghosts of those who were martyred, now has shores that reach across time and space to us. The flames that consume the bodies of the martyrs has changed the light of civilization, lit the path for many of the heroines to walk upon. In the strong hands of these women warriors were the tools needed for healing. From their broken heads poured forth the gold of the alchemist. Out of their radiant lives came the gifts of wisdom and courage gifts sorely needed if the race for equality is to be entered and eventually won. Sunset and autumn also mark the time of harvest. Even as the land wrenches under the abuse of the old paradigm, a new pattern, one of the feminine, slowly emerges. In some places, old patterns tear away. Little by little, the glass ceiling cracks and breaks. The power of gold and silver oozes forth to mingle with the stewardship of both the land and peoples. The Amazon of the mind is freed to pour forth its riches and so to erupt in new opportunity. Is this the fullness of time, the birth of a new paradigm? Perhaps. Has it come with needed strength in time? The question remains unanswered. Mm -hmm. 
The silver thread of life is tattered and worn. Shadows lengthen, night falls. The nest is empty, the weaving is complete. The end is near. Winter and grave whisper their call. Still, this is a time of richness and fullness. It is the time when hands have grown skilled, feet have become strong, and the mind has grown full with wisdom. This is the time of Crone. She wears the purple gown of the priestess, the red cloak of the mother, white breastplate of the maiden, and the gold shield of the goddess. In one hand is the scepter of the serpent, in the other the silver thread of the spirit. In her heart are the gems of talent now polished by experience. Look at her shadow and see hidden riches. Feel her power stirring the unconscious into consciousness. Here is the fulcrum where the female and male aspects of being achieve true balance. Thus does the eagle settle upon the shoulders of the crone, there waiting to soar heavenward with sacred messages. Now the spirit rises. Out of the deep waters of the soul, the goddess, garbed in a new garment of unity, appears. Her robe and cloak are one with the waters of the spirit. Over them she wears the stole of the grandmothers and a bishop's cross of the lotus. She comes forth to claim sovereignty. Even as she turns her face toward the grave and winter, the nest of life fills with the ancient power of the crystal and the protection of the womb. Truly, this is but the beginning. The north wind blows. It summons midnight, midwinter, and death. White and black, all colors and none. The dark side of the hoop of the north is stark and powerful. Death calls. Sometimes it waits, then calls again. Everyone answers this call. Whether the first call or a later one, eventually all hear and all come. On this, the dark side of the hoop, there is stone, hard and ancient, oldest, strongest, and most enduring of all the parts of the mother that we call Earth. This is the substance that gave form to the caves of her body and created for humankind their first homes. Tombs, headstones, sepulchres, to these stones we will entrust our human form when the soul has been set free to find another home. The North speaks. Listen as it tells of both the frailty and the enduring persistence of life. Flecks of gold and silver, spirit and energy, these are the life glow that knows not extinction, for even within the dark stone of death, there are births taking place. Again the wind blows and the north hoop turns. Now there is white, a white that reaches out to caress the black and still the storm. It is here, in the turning, that one can find the balance and the transformation that feeds the soul. It is here that the sky and earth break open revealing the unseen skeletons and outgrown houses. Here they rest in deepest silence, oyster shells and wasp nests, all empty. Even the snake, symbol of death to some, badge of feminine energy and healing to others, even the snake grows too large for its skin and sheds that warm covering. Listen, here in the silent emptiness of death, there can yet be heard the last wailing of a love song. 
the circle, now complete, breaks open. With death, a birth takes place. This is the time of endings, of silence, of preparation. This is the time of transformation. That which was always the same will never be the same again. Well, we've come full circle. Again we stand on the shore of the lake that birthed the hoops, sit in the studio where their bodies were filled and gaze at the trees and the sky that bless this place. As the sun rises, an eagle flies overhead. This is the bird that the Great Spirit long ago gave the Lakota and other First Nation peoples as the conveyor of messages from humans to the Great Creator God. In the golden light of a new day, the sacred messenger drops a feather to bless the work of the spirit hoops. With this, the hoops are sent back out into the world to help promote healing and teach the new paradigm.